Hi, welcome back to the eighth session of Pirate Smugglers in the Making of the Modern World. In the first half today, I was mentioning that there are sort of three topics that come up during the course of today's lectures that are going to be relevant in a carry-on looking particularly at the 20th century. Uh, two of them we've already looked at. Uh, one is the issue of national economies and how their policies in terms of taxes and duties affect smuggling. And this is true aside from any considerations of trading empires. And the second one was the issue of banned substances, substances that are deemed to be uh, inappropriate or even dangerous you know, for consumption within society. Uh, and that become, of course, the target of major smuggling operations. And we saw that with the case of tobacco and, of course, King James's policies and how that carried on down. And we'll see the significance of both of those issues when we look at the 20th century and look at uh, various policies by developing economies in the 20th century and also, of course, policies regarding uh, controlled substances, particularly as we get into the second half of the 20th century and how this becomes a major area of smuggling because of the political implications, because of the social ramifications of the use of these particular products. But now we're going back, in a sense, to uh, our more traditional setting, the one we've been talking about the most for the last few weeks, and that is the issue of a trading empire and its closed trading system and how that encourages smuggling. But it's going to raise the third point, and that is that when we look at smugglers in the North American colonies of Great Britain at this time, we are going to see not simply how state policies encourage smuggling, but more importantly here, we're going to see how smugglers have a significant impact upon the outbreak of the American Revolution and its eventual success. And the larger issue under the surface here is that, as we said at the very beginning of the course, we're not dealing with two distinct systems, with a so-called legitimate trading network, which may be national, international, global, and a separate illegal set of operations that we call smuggling. They're two parts of the same system. And in fact, by changing policies, the so-called legitimate system can have an enormous impact upon the smugglers can threaten their existence. And I'm not talking about increased enforcement, but rather certain policy changes can threaten the smugglers, that their very existence depends upon the enforcement of things like certain kinds of trade bans or having monopolies, etc. They would go out of existence if the legitimate system wasn't enforcing those kinds of policies. So they can actually, their existence is actually threatened by this and they can have an enormous impact upon the so-called legitimate system when they see their interests threatened. And that's what we're going to see in the case of smugglers in Britain's North American colonies in the 18th century. Now, first of all, smuggling in the American colonies uh, becomes significant after 1660, after really 1650 is the first date when England, as I said in the first half, starts to regulate the trade of colonies. And then particularly from 1660 on, as we all the way to the outbreak of the American Revolution, smuggling will become of increasing significance because of the Navigation Acts. And the Navigation Acts are a variety of laws that are passed, regulations that you're usually required to memorize in high school or in a U.S. survey course in which you'll never remember after the, the day you memorize them, and, you know, saying, well, they banned this and they banned that. We're going to mention one or two, but there are a whole string of them. The overall purpose is simply this, that England wants to set up a closed mercantilist system where the colonies trade only with England. Uh, they can only export to England. They can only import from England with some occasional exceptions that suit the system. And the underlying purpose of this whole closed system, of course, as was the case with the Spanish system in the New World, was the idea that the colonies were going to generate wealth for the motherland. They would have to sell their goods to England, and therefore they would not have an open competitive market. Therefore, their prices they would secure for these goods would be lower. And secondly, they would have to buy their manufactured goods in particular from England and again, without options, they would be paying top dollar. 
add to those two profit centers the fact that many of these goods would be subject to duties and excise taxes. Here, too, the government itself would receive revenues in addition to benefiting the overall English economy by having relatively cheap imports from the colonies and being able to charge fairly high prices on its exports to the colonies. In addition, the government itself secures tax revenues because it also taxes this particular trade. Now, one example of the Navigation Acts is the fact that uh, colonial goods and uh, goods in colonial trade can only be shipped in what they called English bottoms, what we would call an English ship. So it had to be an English ship, and supposedly it had to be an English crew, although uh, colonial sailors were considered uh, to compose part of an English crew. The idea was one way of controlling the trade, uh, rather than having you know, the kind of system that the Spanish used, which really wasn't practical in the British colonies, of just shipping goods out of one or two places and into only one port. Instead, another way of clamping down and controlling the trade is saying, well, you can only send goods out or bring them in if it's an English ship that's doing it. Another method of control was to s establish a list of what were called enumerated goods. And the enumerated goods basically were the major exports of the American colonies. Things like rice and indigo and tobacco uh, were the classic examples. They were among the most important exports that the American colonies had. They were so called enumerated goods. And those goods specifically could only be shipped to England or another colonial port. Again, you're going to have to stay within this enclosed system. And they picked these goods because these comprise the bulk of the value of the colony's exports to England and the bulk of their exports, period. Another of these navigation acts that are instituted as the Staples Act in 1663, imports coming into the American colonies must be shipped through England. The idea here is, of course, we don't want France and the Netherlands shipping goods to the American colonies and in the process not paying English duties. So those goods have to come through England first. They can be foreign goods. There are exceptions, as I said, and not everything has to be English manufactured. But if they're going to do that, they have to be imported into England first because they're going to have to be shipped through England. And that means they're going to pay a whale of an import duty. And it'll raise their prices, helping eliminate their competition with similar British goods that are being sent out to the colonies. This system, again, in its piecemeal fashion, as it's constructed down through the decades, has got one basic purpose, create this closed system that ultimately benefits England. One other example was the Navigation Act of 1673. As I said, I'm not going to give you lots of them, but a few, uh, which is called plantation duties. What was it? Well, think of the enumerated goods. What are the most important exports? You know, tea and, I mean, tea, tobacco, indigo, rice. Uh, you're now going to be paying duties on these products. And obviously, what this means is the plantation duties are going to be duties on the most important exports that the American colonies have. All of this with the designed purpose of limiting the, ex you know, the whole colonial commerce system to interchanges between England and the American colonies. If worse comes to worse, yes, if there are goods coming in from other countries, those goods are going to have to pay heavy duties and therefore are going to have a difficult time competing with English goods that are not going to face quite the same level of duties being paid. Now, we've already seen in England that by the 18th century, uh, the English government was going to experiment with lowering duties as a way of getting rid of smuggling and a way, potentially at least, of enhancing revenues. Because as we pointed out in the first half, if you lower duties on imports, if it goes from 50% to 25%, yes, the duty itself is lower. But if you can get more people to legitimately import those same goods, you increase the tax base. Your revenue may not only be equal to what it was when the duty was 50%, it actually may grow, may increase, because more people are going to be willing to work within the established system because they're now only paying a lower duty. So lowering the duties had a dual purpose. Yes, one, to decrease smuggling. But secondly, 
there was the potential, at least it was believed, and it would prove to be true in many cases, that you could actually cut the tax and increase the income because more people were now willing to pay a tax that was not nearly as burdensome and less willing to take the risks of smuggling. But we can see with these various restrictions that clearly the English colonies are facing a problem constantly uh, of having goods that are coming in that are weighed down with all of these duties and expenses and therefore more expensive. And on top of that, where their source of imports is largely restricted to England, this is essentially monopoly pricing, and so they're going to pay a maximum duty. And they also know that they are not in the best position in terms of exporting goods. If there is a great demand for tobacco, et cetera, in France, well, they can't ship tobacco directly from the Carolinas uh, over to France. They have to ship it through England, it has to pay these import-export duties, and that seriously impairs their commerce. And along the way is, of course, a series of inducements to smuggle. Now, smuggling was particularly a major economic activity in New England. In the northeastern states or the northern states, colonies uh, in North America, you know, Mass what became Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, etc. And especially Boston, which was the dominant port in that region at the time. Now, part of what drives the large and widespread smuggling in Boston and in New England in general, the Royal Islanders were generally denounced as a bunch of pirates and thieves uh, by British customs officials, so it wasn't just Boston. But what drives these people in particular is a real problem for the New England economies. These colonies had a problem in that they did not generate the kind of desirable export product that the southern colonies did. There wasn't indigo. There wasn't tobacco. Uh, well, there was a limited amount of tobacco. Uh, and they certainly weren't growing rice. They did not have that key good that would allow them to readily generate exportable products they could send to England, even if the colonial mercantile system was not as burdensome as it was with its restrictions on where you could buy and sell and what the duties and excise taxes were, even if that were not the case, New England already had a serious problem and that had to do with what are we generating that England wants to buy. Complicating that particular issue was the fact that the real money to be made in trade in the colonies was in the importation of British goods, especially British manufactured goods. That's where the big money was. Yeah, you could make money shipping out indigo and tobacco, and you know, there was certainly profit to be made. But the big killer were these high-priced consumer goods brought in from England. The problem is, for the New England colonies, if you don't have something to export, you don't have the money to import. So the New England colonies have to find a way that they can generate revenues that they can use in order to buy these British imports. This is where merchants want to be. They want to be in the importing business as much as they do both import and export. This is where the big business is, but there will be no imports if there aren't exports to help pay for them. The solution for the New England colonies came in their production of lumber and the great forests that covered New England at that time and in their fishing activities off the coast in the Atlantic, especially the uh, capture of codfish, although uh, at this time, cod and other such fish that you now get charged an arm and a leg for uh, were considered fish of inferior quality. And in fact, uh, New England was known for the fact that they produced cheap salted fish. And it wasn't, didn't taste very good. But these two products, cheap fish and lumber, were in heavy demand in the Caribbean, in what the British called the West Indies. And when we talked about uh, the rise of the freebooters and reasons why piracy was becoming less attractive to local economies. We talked about the gradual spread of uh, sugar plantations in the Caribbean islands. And this is precisely what's happening. What were heavily forested islands like Trinidad, etc., are becoming denuded by the rapid cutting of forests across these islands, primarily to clear the land to create wide-scale, large-scale sugar plantations. As the wood is rapidly used up, 
uh, for example, firing the boilers to boil the sugar, uh, there is a need for wood to be imported, particularly to make barrels uh, for the export of molasses, for the export of raw sugar, etc. And there is need for a cheap food product to feed the tens of thousands of slaves who are the basic workforce that keep the sugar plantations operating. So New England, it turns out, had two products that did have a considerable export demand, although it was not directly to England. It would be to the British co uh, colonies in the West Indies, Jamaica, et cetera. These are the places where sugar would be grown and where there would be demand for these products. In turn, the New Englanders could get molasses which they could turn into liquor, uh, which was great because it was a great sale product, both for domestic consumption but also for export. This is a time uh, when we're getting into the uh, making and drinking on a wide scale of what we call hard liquor. And we're going to get into the distilled uh, beverages, as we like to say, in the polite world. Uh, stuff that has a kick to it, and it has a high alcohol content. Something that goes beyond you know, more subtle fermented beverages like uh, beers and ales and wines. Uh, distilled liquor, uh, that's what demon rum is all about. And we'll see the importance of this when we get to uh, prohibition. But this is the kind of stuff uh, that was becoming widely popular in which there was huge demand not only there but overseas and so this would give New England an exportable product that could earn the revenues that they needed. The problem is as with almost all kinds of trade in the British colonial or colonial system uh, you're gonna pay taxes up the wazoo, you're gonna pay excise taxes, you're gonna pay duty on the molasses itself. And so one of the things that smugglers quickly focused in on uh, was the smuggling of molasses out of the West Indies and into New England to avoid paying the duty. Uh, a lot of this occurred you know, directly smuggling from the British colonies, but also, of course, the New Englanders were enterprising, and they would turn to, for example, the French colony and what was uh, the island of Saint-Dominique, which is really the western part of the island, Haiti, uh, the modern nation, they would turn to foreign colonies as well that were producing sugar, and there they could also smuggle out molasses. Uh, they weren't really particular about it. It was just usually easier to deal with you know, the other British officials whom uh, they sort of knew the, the way they behaved and uh, how they responded. Uh, but they were willing to go either to British colonies or to European colonies of other nations, France, uh, Spain, etc., and smuggle molasses out of there and into New England, and therefore saving themselves a hefty piece of change. In addition to this, uh, as they gained revenues with which to buy manufactured goods, smugglers also turned to the importation illegally of European manufactured goods. And most of the time, it's the same merchant houses are doing both. You know, they're sending lumber and fish down to the Caribbean, smuggling molasses back. You don't bother smuggling <laughs> lumber and fish. It just doesn't pay. Uh, too much of a bulk product and too low in value per unit. But they would then smuggle the molasses back in, and then they would smuggle the European goods in that they wanted to buy because then they didn't have to pay British duties and British excise taxes. The goods were much cheaper. You could make a lot more money. So. New England merchants, those who engaged in this kind of activity, were basically hitting the system at both ends. They were both smuggling imports uh, from the Caribbean and smuggling imports from Europe. So much of the system was essentially being undermined by this activity uh, where New Englanders were making money at both ends of the system. And they weren't the only ones. I mean. Uh, Merchants all along the coast of the colonies were involved in this, but particularly in New England, there was this heightened degree of activity because they needed to be smuggling the molasses because they didn't have a readily acceptable export product to England like indigo, tobacco, or rice. So there is more of this activity, particularly in New England and especially in Boston. And here I've given you the names of a couple of merchants in New England, who were in Boston, were very prominent at the time, well-known individuals. Uh, one was called Mathiah Bourne, and the other one was Solomon Davis. Uh, they actually had a partnership, a merchant house which they ran together. Uh, 
there was also uh, Thomas Rowe, uh, who was another of these Boston merchants. And these were people of high society. I mean, they lived in expensive, what we would call, I suppose, townhomes in Boston at this time. They were well-accepted members of the upper crust of Boston society, but they were also smugglers. In fact, uh, they were engaged in just about all the smuggling activities that we've already mentioned and that you could imagine. They were smuggling goods in from the Netherlands, uh, manufactured imports, uh, smuggling goods out to France, and smuggling molasses. So whether it was imports, exports, they were smuggling all around. And they were of a certain group within the merchant community at this time. Within the merchant community, most merchants, it can probably be safely said, did not rely primarily on smuggling at this time, although almost all of them did some smuggling. John Hancock was well known as you know, one of the fathers of the American Revolution, uh, perhaps the leading merchant of Boston at this time, uh, would fall into that category where most Boston merchants fit. And that is, uh, most of his business was legitimate, but a portion of it was smuggled as well. But people like Bourne, uh, they were involved up to their ears because most of their business would have been smuggled goods, both imports and exports. And there was a fairly substantial group, and these are the people that I refer to as smugglers. Uh, the other merchants, the majority, like Hancock, we, we don't put into this category because they do not have the same kind of vested interest in smuggling that the others do. Yes, they have problems with the existing trade system, with the tariffs and the duties, etc. but they are not devoting the primary focus of their uh, business activities to smuggling, whereas people like Bourne and Davis indeed are, and Roe would be another one. Now, one of the things that the British attempt at this time uh, to solve their problem as they attempted in England was to crack down on smuggling. In other words, to attempt to enforce the duties more rigorously uh, than ever before. Uh, this is an attempt to choke off the smuggling process. And it, as you would expect, involved uh, heavier use of the Royal Navy to try to hunt down the smugglers, uh, a gr greater uh, vigilance in terms of customs officials and what they were doing. One of the people that gets caught up in this effort to more vigorously enforce customs duties is the customs collector in the port of Boston. Uh, he was a man named Benjamin Barons. Now, Barons had been a London merchant and been fairly successful in his enterprise and along the way had accumulated a fair amount of political influence. Thanks to that political influence, he received this appointment as the customs collector in the port of Boston. Now again, this was not always attractive to people in England, uh, but if you thought you could make a fair amount of money out of it, and Barons was always interested in making money, uh, then you might well take on the task. And besides, uh, if you took Boston, uh, New York, Philadelphia, you were dealing with cities, well, certainly not on the scale of London, but reasonably comfortable, comfortable urban centers. So Barons agreed to take the job. However, from the first, it was clear to the other British officials in the colony that he wasn't terribly intent on actually enforcing the customs duties. His general practice was essentially when he found smuggled goods was to go back to the merchant and say, you know, these must have slipped through, <laughs> you know, and we didn't pay the duty. Why don't you come over to the customs house and pay the duty now? Uh, in other words, you get a second chance every time that, okay, I realize that we've caught you smuggling, but I'm not going to seize the goods. I'm not going to impose a penalty. I'm simply going to make you pay the customs duty that you would have paid anyways. Obviously, there's not much of a threat in that. Uh, and obviously, Barron's was taking something on the cuff for this because, of course, what he was doing was stopping an occasional cargo of smuggled goods, making the person go back and paying the duties, but letting them know, you know, I'm really on your side, a little bit of money in my pocket, and you know that this will only happen occasionally, and the worst that can happen is you actually have to pay the duty uh, that you would have paid anyways. So this kind of, we can call it even lax enforcement, uh, came to the attention of uh, provincial officials, colonial officials in Boston, 
and Barons was suspended from his job because he wasn't doing it. Uh, he appealed to the officials in London, and after a number of months of debating and battling, uh, he was reinstated as the chief customs collector. At that point, he proceeded to go back and do just what he'd been doing <laughs> before he was dismissed, and that was doing very little in the way of enforcement of the customs laws and was dismissed a second time. In this process, in the beginning of the 1760s, New England merchants, Boston merchants, rise to the defense of barons. They begin a series of uh, confrontations with colonial officials. They appeal to the government back in London. Uh, they publish letters in the local press denouncing colonial officials and the unfairness of this. They hold public demonstrations in favor of barons. Uh, and they engage in a bit of intimidation as well. Uh, Thomas Hutchinson, uh, who was then serving on the Governor's Council, uh, found his house being burned down by a particularly unruly group of protesters. So the merchants, and especially the smugglers, uh, learned to engage in a variety of rather aggressive political tactics uh, to defend their interests, uh, from political gatherings to propaganda to petitioning, and if necessary, a little bit of violence on the side, <laughs> just to let people know that they were serious. Uh, this really helps set the stage for the events that will follow that lead directly into the American Revolution. And in particular, it was the event that got the merchants in Boston uh, to organize a committee to represent their interests on issues of this kind. And of course, this would naturally come to include issues of the import duties and export duties being paid. So they had a semi-permanent organization, if you will, a British um, or Boston Merchants Committee, uh, which was going to start to provide an institutionalized way for them to express their concerns and their demands. And it's notable that people like Bourne and Davis uh, and other smugglers played very prominent role in this committee and other committees that would be established over time to address specific issues uh, like the uh, East India Company and the tea monopoly as other committees were formed to address those specific issues. Time and again, we find the smugglers at the forefront of those committees. And indeed, one of the next issues that's going to become central to the emergence of the smugglers as a political force and more generally the Boston merchants is the issue of tea. We've already seen that the British East India Company has a monopoly on tea imports into England. And from there, they would bring the tea in, pay the duties, the excise taxes, and then the tea is auctioned off. And from there, those wholesalers go on to sell it to retailers, et cetera, et cetera. This same monopoly directly affected the American colonies because the British East India Company did the same thing with tea designated for the colonies. In other words, tea was exported to England, it was auctioned off, and then shipped on to the American colonies for sale. The American colonies faced the same problem, or the American colonists faced the same problem as tea guzzlers in England at this time, and that is one, there's a monopoly that controls the tea, so prices are going to be high no matter what. Two, there are import duties to be paid. And three, there are excise taxes to be paid. So you've got a triple whammy uh, that all work towards raising the price of tea to the average consumer, and this affects the American colonies as much as it does uh, the average English consumer. Now. Not surprisingly, the American colonists came up with the same idea as Englishmen in their homeland, and that was, what are you going to do? You're going to smuggle tea. And tea is being smuggled in from the Netherlands. Remember, the Dutch are extending their trading empire into Asia. They are in China. They, too, have access to tea. So they have tea available, and of course, they're willing to sell it at a price considerably lower than the price being charged by the East India Company based on all these import duties and taxes and monopolies and fees and so forth. So Dutch tea is going to be cheaper. It's going to be smuggled into the country. And once again, this became a major focus for smugglers like Bourne and Davis and Rowe, et cetera. This was a major opportunity for them 
with this consumer product growing as it had to become the customary drink of the English, this is a way to make a considerable amount of money by bringing this product in. Now, as we get into the 1770s, this is the time when the English government has started to experiment with reducing duties, reducing excise taxes on selected products, not tobacco of course, but on selected products in an effort to reduce smuggling and possibly actually increase revenues, as we talked about earlier. In the colonies, they are going to receive, or at least are intended to receive, the benefit of one of these policies, specifically the one affecting the importation of tea. In 1773, under the Tea Act, the English government agreed to reduce the duties on imported tea. That translates into, well, if duties go down on the imported tea, that means the tea being shipped out is going to be shipped out at a lower price to the colonies than it was in the past. Logically, this is news that should be met with a great cry of support from consumers in the American colonies because, of course, it's going to reduce their costs. However, there's a catch to this. Not that it would affect the consumers, but now the East India Company is going to be allowed to ship the tea directly to the American colonies and sell it there themselves. They will have consignees, people who will essentially accept the tea and then arrange for its sale in New England. But now the British East India Company can control the tea from China to London on to Boston. That becomes their end point of sale for the East India Company. Meanwhile, and this was true, of course, in England as well, the taxes on tea would remain in place. There was going to be, the overall effect would be a reduction in price because the duty would be reduced, but taxes were still going to have to be paid on the tea as well. Nevertheless, the overall effect was going to be lower prices for tea in the colonies, and this was something that, again, was looked upon as particularly burdensome. Tea had become such a widespread consumer product that the idea that you had to pay taxes on it uh, was particularly irksome to people. Uh, they considered it, you know, by now, as much as it's not a necessity, they considered it a necessity. Uh, and to have to pay taxes on that, that's why you don't see generally sales taxes on most food items that you buy because people say, hey, that's a necessity, you know. Even though everything else you buy in the same supermarket is going to be taxed, food items usually are not because they're things that people feel absolutely essential and they see that kind of tax as far too burdensome. Now, while consumers might have welcomed this, and in fact, when the Tea Act is announced in the American colonies after its proclamation in May of 1773, uh, there is no outcry against uh, this decision. Uh, even merchants, at least at first, are not saying much of anything, and consumers certainly you know, aren't unhappy with the prospect, at least, that their uh, cost of living is going to go down, if only slightly, uh, by this change. However, one group that's not happy with this new piece of legislation are the smugglers. People like Bourne and Davis clearly faced a serious challenge here. Clearly, one of the major purposes of this type of legislation at the, was to eliminate smugglers. You eliminate smuggling, you eliminate smugglers, to reduce the profit margin that smugglers would enjoy by making tea less expensive. So this is a major threat to the smugglers. This is the best product they have going. Now, this isn't you know, high-priced manufactured goods, whether smuggled in from the Netherlands or from England itself. Uh, and this is in molasses that still had to be processed, etc. This was a product that every man, woman, and child in the American colonies uh, was making use of. It was a gold mine. But now the threat was that it would not be the profitable gold mine it had been for a number of years. Although the merchant community didn't react at first, there is soon a response led by the smugglers. 
Now, the problem for the smugglers is this. How do you go out and imp you know, oppose a piece of legislation that's lowering the price of a basic consumer good to the entire population? I mean, talk about you know, losing community support. This certainly seemed a guaranteed way of doing that. I mean, how do you go against you know, a tax cut and say, well, it's not good for us. You know, this is a danger or a threat. But the smugglers came up with an answer. Now, there was some legitimacy to this argument. This isn't, you know, they didn't just invent this particular argument I'm going to mention and you know, sell it to a, a gullible public. But they had to be careful on how they attack the threat to their interests. Because go out and say, hey, look, it, we're smuggling this stuff, and you know, we're going to lose a fortune if they reduce the duties. is isn't going to win you a lot of friends. Instead, the attack came on the East India Company as a monopoly, and specifically on that provision in the navigation laws, or the new navigation laws, that said that the company could directly deliver the tea into the American colonies. The point that the smugglers and then other merchants began making was what we're seeing here is a threat to the whole trading system of our colonies. Because what's going to happen is once the East India Company can come in and start selling tea directly and use their monopolistic practices, the next thing you know, they'll expand and they'll take over the import into these colonies of every product imaginable. Pretty soon, there won't be a merchant community in the American colonies. Our economy will be controlled as never before by England and by this monopolistic company. So if you thought things were bad before, with duties and limits on where you could trade, etc., can you imagine what it will be like when you have to deal only with the East India Company? You want to export indigo or rice? You want to import goods from England or any place else? The British East India Company will control all that. Now, that's not what the legislation said, but this is what the smugglers and the merchants in general begin to focus in on, that this is the real danger, that this is just a Trojan hoss that's being put out there. Yeah, sure, they're selling you on the low price of tea that you'll see, but in the long run, how long do you think that price will remain low once this company completely controls the distribution of tea in the American colonies? So this is where they made their attack, and this was an argument that people would be sensitive to. American colonists in general resented the whole structure of the Navigation Acts, the burdens on both their exports and their imports, and the idea that the system could actually be made manifestly worse by being subjected to the control of the British East India Company was bound to spark popular unrest. And indeed, what happens next is that through their committees, the Boston merchants, merchants in New England in general, begin pressuring the consignees, the people who are to receive the tea on behalf of the British East India Company and then sell it to the retailers to either not accept the tea or return whatever they may have. Mm -hmm. That the tea that is now sitting in the harbor will not be picked up, it will not be accepted by the consignees, it will be turned back. And how do they do this? Well, they're threatening the consignees. The consignees are just some abstraction called consignees. They're merchants as well. And their business is being threatened, that other merchants will have no dealings with them. You know, you want an extension of credit next time when you need a little bit of extra. You're a mid-level merchant. I'm John Hancock. I, my business is five times your, the size of your business. You periodically have to come to me to get credit to continue doing business. You'll never see another dime out of me. We will have nothing to do with you. We'll buy nothing from you, sell nothing to you. You'll be isolated. So the pressure is put on the consignees not to accept the tea. And many of them will sign an agreement, not all of them, not to accept the tea. Not that they really wanted to do this, but of course they were being pressured and threatened. The smugglers and the merchants in general had learned certain tactics in their earlier effort to keep Bournes in as the customs collector. The argument now is you must return the tea. However, the new governor of Massachusetts, the same man who was on the governor's council in an earlier epic in the fight over the customs collector who got his house burned down, Thomas Hutchinson, uh, 
as the governor, he says, no, there will be no return of tea, that this is perfectly legal and legitimate. You know, these are laws of England that we're operating under. There's no reason why the tea should be returned, and therefore the process will go on. It's at that point in December of 1773 that we have, of course, uh, the Boston Tea Party, where 340 chests of tea uh, being stored on ships, British ships in Boston Harbor uh, are thrown off the ships and into Boston Harbor and destroyed uh, by individuals dressed up as Native Americans, I mean, Indian costume, um, largely to disguise their appearance because most of these people were in fact people who had either been active participants in one of the merchants uh, committees or were local artisans who uh, had worked closely on various political causes with the merchants uh, and they take this drastic action. This is breaking the law. <laughs> now, this isn't, you know, in the past smuggling, for example, molasses smuggling, most merchants didn't consider that to really be breaking the law or to be unpatriotic and it was just a practical matter of business that you, know, you might have to do that at least periodically to uh, make a go of it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, many of them did shy away from actually violating uh, the rules prohibiting imports from other countries. Some of them actually felt that really would be unpatriotic, that it was a threat to the British economy or whatever. Um, but up until this time, hardly any of them would have entertained the idea of actually uh, engaging in this kind of destruction of property. I mean, after all, they were capitalists themselves. The, the whole idea of the sanctity of private property is uh, central to their belief system. So to go out and not only break the law, but specifically violate certain private property rights to destroy this property uh, clearly indicated just how far the smugglers had helped carry the merchants in terms of how far they were willing to go to challenge the British mercantile system and to try to bring it uh, to an end. But of course, the real agenda of the smugglers is not to end the duty on tea. It's to see that this particular act is not enforced because it will reduce the duty on tea and reduce their interest. So the, the smugglers, as much as, yes, they join the general outcry against the monopoly of the East India Company, nevertheless, they are focused on their own particular selfish interest, which is we basically want to end this process. We want to go back to the existing system where duties will remain relatively high and our business will continue to flourish. But in the short term, what they have managed to do is stir the larger community and bring on a widespread political action that has massive uh, implications for not only the East India Company, but for the fate of the American colonies. The response of the English government initially was to insist that Massachusetts, and specifically Boston, uh, was going to have to pay for the destroyed tea. They were going to have to pay for those 340 chests of tea that had been destroyed. And the colonists were going to have to make up for this crime. Uh, that was not really an unreasonable or extreme uh, demand at that point. But, of course, Tempers had been flaring by now. The confrontations had gone on with the consignees, with Governor Hutchinson. Now, the merchants are unwilling, as are the residents of Boston in general, to accept what was probably a reasonable punishment. You know, okay, we did bad, we destroyed something, now we're going to have to pay for it collectively. They refused. At that point, the British Parliament responded with the intolerable acts, which again, there's a long list of them, but uh, you know, this isn't a course on the American Revolution. The main point is the intolerable acts essentially close the port of Boston, so its economy is going to shrivel and lead to the military occupation of Boston as well. Boston becomes an occupied city as a result of these events, as a result of the Boston Tea Party. Now, let me stress at this point that I'm not trying to make an argument that, you know, the only reason we had the American Revolution is because a bunch of smugglers in Boston were looking to keep their profits up. By far from it. Obviously, there are a wide array of issues, and some of these issues that were of concern to the smugglers in terms of how the uh, mercantilist trading system worked uh, were of general concern within the colonies themselves. What I'm trying to point out is that a significant element, a significant catalyst in bringing the revolution about 
had to do with this particular group of smugglers and their efforts to challenge the system, which was threatening them, not because they were getting better at enforcing the customs duties, but because they actually threatened to reduce the customs duty and therefore threaten the interests of the smugglers. So whatever their ultimate intentions, the fact is that the smugglers played a central role in the organizing of the Boston merchants and in the activities, specifically the Boston Tea Party, that led up to a sequence of events, now almost inevitable, that brought about the American Revolution. One thing that the intolerable acts do is actually consolidate activities in the colonies against British interests. Not necessarily British rule, because even now many people were not necessarily anxious to get rid of British rule. It leads to the creation of the Continental Association, which is a loose association among the colonies in October of 1774. Uh, and what the association agrees to is in trade with uh, Britain and the British West Indies. In other words, okay, you want to cut off the trade in Boston, we're going to respond. We won't trade with England or its colonies in the Caribbean. And that was to continue until there was an end to the duties on various colonial exports like tea and sugar, and of course an end to the intolerable acts. So here we see, as I was just saying, that obviously there are grievances that go far beyond what Boston smugglers or Boston merchants wanted uh, that involve all of the colonies. But the smugglers' activity helped catalyze this whole process and helped bring on this larger, albeit loose, organization among the colonies, resisting the British mercantilist system as it impacted the colonies. It is not very far down the road to April 19, 1775, when British soldiers who are searching for weapons uh, being hidden and by Patriot organizers and for a number of Patriot leaders themselves uh, confront uh, colonial militias in Lexington and Concord first shots are fired of the American Revolution. As much as smuggling played a key role, although not the dominant role in bringing about the revolution, it is smuggling and smugglers who will also play a key role in assuring the success of the American Revolution. Because from the moment that shots were fired in Massachusetts, the odds of the American colonists defeating the British military seemed to be slim to none. And England was one of the great military powers of the world at this time. Its colonies are still a series of struggling human outposts on a largely undeveloped continent, far removed from the major centers of civilization and economic activity in the world at this time. There would have been few people, even within the colonies, that would have predicted favorably that the revolution would lead to the defeat of the British. However, in the end, smugglers are going to help tip the balance in favor of the Americans. And again, this is not an argument to say, you know, we only won the American Revolution because of smugglers. Obvious, a variety of factors, leadership, popular support, and the help of the French, as much as some people in the current day may not be too happy with them, the fact is they played a very key role in terms of uh, supplying us with goods and providing naval assistance uh, that made a critical difference at all wide variety of factors. The distraction of the British military that had more than the North American colonies to worry about. But there is a key role for smugglers to play here again, not only in bringing about the revolution, but helping lead to its successful conclusion. They were going to help make up the difference between this British Goliath and the American David. And one of the biggest distinctions, besides the actual size of military forces, between the two opposing groups is that England was already an industrial power before the end of the 18th century. It was the leading industrial power. It had factories that could turn out the basic products of war. And when you're going to fight a war, you need weapons. 
you need ammunition. And at this time, you need barrels of gunpowder to fire the weapons. The American colonies don't have the basic industrial infrastructure that will allow them to generate any significant production. I mean, the idea that they were going to be producing muskets and uh, balls for firing and gunpowder would have been very difficult for them to do successfully. They simply did not have that industrial base. They were going to have to get those goods somewhere. The place, oh, I should say one of the places that they would turn uh, was a small island in the Caribbean. It was a Dutch-controlled island uh, called St. Eustatius. It was called the Golden Rock. First of all, a little bit like the island of Gibraltar, it was basically a rock, a piece of stony outcropping perched on the surface of the Caribbean. Its value, as a good real estate agent would say, was first location, location, location. It was in the Caribbean. It was at a point where trade routes intersected as European vessels from France, from Spain, from England, from the Netherlands, etc., brought goods into the Caribbean, brought goods into their own colonies in the Caribbean, and, and goods to Spain's large land-based colonies in Mesoamerica and South America. This was a key trading nexus for the Western world. But location, by that standard, there were hundreds of islands in the Caribbean that fit that description, that had you know, a location in this general area. The other key for St. Eustatius was that it was a free port. Now, free ports can be traced back all the way to ancient history, but there were very few of them. There were one or two in the Mediterranean, for example. Uh, their sort of early modern flourishing can be traced back to Hamburg, Germany, the port city of Hamburg in Germany. And what a free port is, in simple terms, is a place where you can bring goods in and not pay an import duty, take them out again, and not pay an export duty. It's free. The ideal of an export of a free port is simply this, that it lies in an area of considerable trade, and merchants can use it for transshipping goods. In other words, let us say, I want to ship my sugar from Island X over to Europe. But I don't have a vessel that's going to cross the ocean. I have a small vessel, a small merchant. I take the sugar there to St. Eustatius. I drop it off in a warehouse where a larger merchant vessel will pick it up and bring it on to whatever its destination is. The key here is I don't have to pay duties going in or out. I just use this place as a stopping point. This is enormously attractive. For example, if we look at trading systems in Europe in the Middle Ages, if you sail down the Rhine in Germany, you see all these beautiful castles, half of which are kind of fakes because they were actually built in the 19th century, not back in the Middle Ages. But in the Middle Ages, you also had these great castles along the Rhine. And what they were there for, basically, were to collect customs duties. Uh, not that they represented individual countries. They were little principalities, not much bigger than the castle itself. But every few miles, you get to stop and pay another tax, another tax. If there was some place along the way that said, hey, you're welcome here, and you can drop your goods off, and we're not going to charge you, what a relief. With Hamburg and the north coast of Germany, the idea is there are all these different markets that you may want to go to. You're an English merchant, and you may want to ship grain, you know, well, not necessarily grain, but manufactured goods into Russia, uh, into products of various German principalities. And again, like that sugar merchant down in the Caribbean, what you can do in this case, again, is ship the goods to Hamburg. No duty going in, no duty coming out. Some other merchant can take the goods on from there to these other countries, and you've had to pay no duty. This is an ideal opportunity for moving goods 
and for reorganizing cargoes. Because, for example, you're a shipper, you've got you know, four different cargoes going four different locations. If you can drop a couple of those cargoes off and no, you only have to do your local stops and let somebody else take the long distance hauls, that's great. And you can do that in a free port without having to pay import or export duties. This was the ideal of St. Eustatius. And of course, in particular, given its location among all of these different colonial possessions in the Caribbean, each of which was prohibited from trading with the other, in other words, the British colonies couldn't trade with the French, couldn't trade with the Spanish, etc. Where better to go mm -hmm. to smuggle in the end, <laughs> even though you're not calling that it's a free port, where better to go than St. Eustatius? You go there, you take your cargo there, you're not going to have to pay any import duties uh, to the Dutch or the French or anybody else, and there you can get manufactured goods coming from Europe, and again, they haven't had to pay any import duties or export duties going in and out of St. Eustatius. So this is ideal. You know, this is a place where you can sell goods to another country, even though technically you're not breaking the law because you're not selling it. Uh, you're an English planter or an English merchant from Jamaica. Uh, you're selling your sugar uh, in St. Eustatius. Now you know it's a French merchant that's going to buy it, and French and English, of course, are at you know, dagger's points throughout the 18th century, but you're not really selling it to him. You take it to a warehouse in St. Eustatius. He later buys it from that location. You, you never send anything out, and you're not importing goods illegally from France or the Netherlands. You're importing them from St. Eustatius. So this is an ideal location because of these reasons. One, its location itself. The fact that this free port allows particularly these merchants in these competing colonial systems to readily exchange goods with each other and with countries in Europe that they were not allowed to trade with. So St. Eustatius and other free ports at this time flourish for that reason. Now, you might well ask, well, why is this allowed to go on? You know, doesn't somebody go after the Dutch? Uh, well, first of all, the British, for example, also had a free port uh, and port of Spain on the island of Trinidad. But more importantly, it's allowed to exist because all of these countries know in, their end, in the end there is some value to this, to having this free port. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, Switzerland's position over the years that you say, well, God, they've got those banking laws where anybody can do anything. Why do, are they allowed to go on doing that? Because every country knows they have an interest in having that kind of blind system where money can be deposited and taken out and can't be traced, or at least <laughs> that was true in the past. When there are colonial wars, when there are wars in Europe, trade is often cut off between the mother country and the colonies. Here is a practical solution that they can access goods relatively reasonably, they won't starve, their economies won't collapse, even though the mother country may not be able to ship goods out, may not be able to import goods from her colonies, they can go to a free port and survive. That's why these free ports were allowed to survive, and no one went after them, even though England or France had a great navy, army, whatever, and could have destroyed the place. They didn't, at least at this time, go after it. American colonial merchants, not surprisingly, took advantage of this process, although they traded and smuggled with a variety of colonies. They, too, were participating in this kind of trade at this time. And the basic idea prior to the American Revolution was that, again, they could go down there and exchange products, even though it was, you know, cod and lumber, uh, for products coming from Europe or if they had molasses, instead of taking molasses back to New England, they could take it to St. Eustatius and trade it for European manufactured goods and come back. So it was a, not a frequent, but a common trading and smuggling outpost, because that's what it was really all about, given the colonial restrictions on trade, uh, that American colonial merchants had used over time. They were quite familiar with it and used it on a fairly regular basis. After the American Revolution breaks out on November 16th in 1776, an American vessel called the Andrew Doria entered the harbor at St. Eustatius, flying uh, the Stars and Stripes, what became the, well, not the Stars and Stripes at that time, but the flag of the American colonies, the new American nation. The governor of St. Eustatius, the Dutch governor, fired a cannon in salute you know, which would be a common recognition for a ship flying the flag of another nation. That's an act of respect. Uh, 
What was so critical here was that of the American colonies, of course, are not a generally recognized nation at this point. Uh, they are certainly in the eyes of the British uh, a group of rebels uh, against legitimate British rule. So the governor was taking a considerable risk but demonstrating the fact that there was a close bond between the merchants and economic interests of St. Eustatius and the American colonies. That was true not only for the Dutch and their colony, it was even truer for the American colonists and merchants. The Andrew Doria that sailed into the harbor at St. Eustatius was in fact a merchant vessel that had been converted to become one of the first vessels of the new American Navy. And it symbolized the desperate need of the American colonies for military staples that would allow them to fight their revolution. Yes, it was now equipped with cannon, but it was going to need shot to fire that cannon. Fire those cannon, it was going to need gunpowder to trigger that cannon. Generally, there is a massive shortage of military hardware and supplies in the American colonies. George Washington is quoted here for no more than nine cartridges to a man. That's how he described uh, the equipment that his men had. They were limited to nine cartridges apiece. Um, the rebels at Bunker Hill in Boston uh, in many cases had to pick up their weapons and try to fight hand to hand because before the British even reached the top of the hill in their assault they had run out of cartridges. They no longer had uh, weapons that they could fire. Generally speaking, the rebel troops constantly had to be concerned about a shortage of military equipment and supplies uh, used to fight this revolution. To deal with its early concerns about the American colonies and the possibilities of revolution, the British had banned warlike materials. They had declared warlike materials to be contraband. In other words, uh, you couldn't bring uh, gunpowder and other such products into the American colonies anymore as of 1774 because the British knew that this would be a key element in any rebellion against them. This would be, in fact, the Achilles heel of the American colonial uh, revolution uh, was its lack of sufficient military supplies. From the outset, the American colonists are going to look to St. Eustatius as a key area for gaining these supplies that they need. And specifically, uh, they're engaged in a new kind of smuggling. You know, from the old days, it was uh, bring down tobacco, indigo, whatever, uh, and molasses, perhaps, that you had gotten from British colonies and trade it for, you know, manufactured goods, frying pans, glass, whatever, from Europe. Now, you have to bring those same colonial goods, but now you're trading them for military stores, for the gunpowder, the weapons that you need to fight the revolution. The supplies coming in in this manner are critical to the survival of the American revolutionary forces early in their battle against the British. Uh, one British official is quoted as saying, the Americans would have had to abandon their revolution if they had not been aided by Dutch greed. Of course, you know, again, this is all, <laughs> depends on your point of view. <laughs> Once it was business as business, you know, St. Eustatius could be a free port because everybody knew there would be times when every colony would need to be able to trade uh, when they couldn't trade with the mother country. But now, of course, it had taken on a political U because the British were trying to defeat the American Revolution. And the use of this free port was allowing the Americans to gain access to uh, military supplies that they desperately needed. Uh, the British ultimately would have their revenge. Uh, they would get revenge on St. Eustatius and this free port. Uh, when Admiral George Romney uh, attacked St. Eustatius in February of 1781. He led a naval expedition against it, uh, engaged in a day-long cannonade that destroyed many of the buildings in the port and then occupied the port itself, uh, expelling many of the merchants uh, from the island itself. Uh, 
under other circumstances, this of course would have been considered an outrage by other colonial powers because of course the idea was as a free port, St. Eustatia served all of their interests ultimately in one way or another. But of course the British would justify it on the grounds that you know, this island had been used to undermine their rule in their North American colonies. But St. Eustatius is one example, and there are others, of the smuggling that went on during the American Revolution that were was essential for the survival of the revolution itself. Without such infusions of material, although ultimately countries like France probably supplied more in the way of um, military goods than could be uh, bought in St. Eustatius, nevertheless, this was a critical element in the early days of the revolution. So smugglers not only help bring on the American Revolution, they also provide an important service in helping to see the revolution succeed. Needless to say, they were also making a buck while they were doing this. Putting all of this together, looking at smuggling in England and its colonies roughly from the 1500s through the 1700s, we've seen again some of the sort of traditional sources of smuggling, monopolies and trading empires. We see with England and its relationship with its North American colonies, these highly restrictive navigation acts. You can only ship in English vessels. Uh, you have to pay duties. Uh, you can't import goods into the colonies without those goods going through England, so forth and so on. A classic trading empire. Not quite as restrictive as the one that Spain created with her colonies. Uh, somewhat more flexible, but nevertheless, a trading empire nonetheless, and this of course became a major encouragement to smuggling in the American colonies. But we've also seen the monopolistic system of the uh, East India Company and how that encouraged smuggling both in England and in the colonies because of course you already have duties and taxes add to that a monopolistic source of the product, especially tea of course, and now you have three different sources of spiking prices for imported goods that naturally encourage smuggling because of the huge price differentials that they create. But at the same time, in looking specifically at England in the first half today, we saw that it isn't just the matter of creating a trading empire or establishing a monopoly uh, that leads to smuggling. As we will see, well, piracy and certainly smuggling both by the 1720s, piracy had largely been eliminated in much of the world. And then smuggling is going to fade. It was already decreasing rapidly in England by the 1830s and will continue that trend in much of the world uh, throughout the 19th century. That, well, that and the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company, these monopolies, will disappear along the way as well. That these two obvious sources of smuggling that we've looked at throughout this chronological period well, they will disappear. We won't have trading empires of this sort, certainly not by the middle of the 20th century. We won't have monopolies, certainly not of this type anymore, in international trade. Nevertheless, smuggling will go on, and it will go on to no small degree due to the factors that we just looked at in England, and that is nation states and their decisions about taxation policies and import and export duties those decisions, as much as any larger trading empire or any monopoly, are enough by themselves to trigger widespread smuggling. And this is going to be true in the second half of the 20th century as much as it was true in the second half of the 18th century. So England is an important example to look at, to project on into the next several centuries as we look at the disappearance of two major motivating factors for smuggling and yet see it persist and even explode in the 20th century, we need to look at nation states' policies towards their own economies and towards the larger international economy. Another factor that we've examined before, and certainly the case of England reinforces, is the fact that early modern bureaucracies weren't very efficient. People were political appointees, pay was low or non-existent, and both of those factors meant you did not have people who had a great deal of devotion to the idea of enforcing duties and taxes, etc., and people who, in fact, had a very large vested interest in taking bribes in order not to have to collect those duties. There's also 
this factor of accepting reality. In other words, as with the trading empires, so too with the national economy. Political rulers realize at times that indeed their systems are irrational. That you have to allow some leeway for getting around some of these extraordinary duties and taxes. Just as Spanish colonial officials re had realized for centuries that you know, we have to allow some smugglers to come in and sell goods here because otherwise people are going to starve. There hasn't been a vessel from Spain in two years. Uh, we have to sell somebody our goods and there hasn't been again a vessel from Spain in two years. So we accept some smuggling. So too British officials accepted the limitations that well we can't really hope to enforce across the board these extraordinarily high duties. And more importantly even was the fact that we have to accept the political reality that merchants are powerful individuals. They are important to the government. Their trade generates what we do get from the duties. And more importantly, the merchants are there for emergency loans to the government, and they're there to provide their ships in times of warfare. We don't want to alienate the merchants entirely, so we're going to let a lot of this ride. Another factor that we just looked at but again, will become important in the 20th century in particular, are free ports. There are not many free ports in the 18th century. Uh, St. Eustatius was one, uh, Port of Spain and Trinidad was another, Gibraltar uh, was, became a free port, but they're not widespread. And they wouldn't be until the second half of the 20th century. Then we're going to see an explosion in these free ports and we'll see the diversity of activities they take on besides simply allowing goods to be sort of shipped in and out without duties. Free ports play a significant role in this particular story of the American Revolution. But as we will see, they will play an even larger role in the second half of the 20th century uh, in terms of the process of smuggling. And we'll see why that happens, but we see in St. Eustatius an early example of how ports, free ports can be used for smuggling activities and how valuable they can be for that purpose. Another factor that we've seen affecting smuggling is the question of consumer goods and community sentiment. And this is important to consider for the future as well. Here we're talking about goods that are consumed across the community when we talk about England and things like tobacco and tea. And when we're talking about silks, uh, silver and gold mm -hmm. from Spain, uh, from uh, the New World, uh, silks from India, etc., and even in many cases spices, uh, the more expensive spices, and that was true of most of the spices coming from Asia. These are goods that most people simply can't afford, have nothing to do with. But we're now getting to an age in the 18th century where things like tea, tobacco, everyone's consuming them. So if duties are high, if taxes are high, you're not just annoying the elite, you're not just annoying merchants, you're annoying the entire community. And when you do that, you're going to have to pay a political price. It's going to make it difficult to enforce economic policies that are causing high prices in consumer goods. We're going to see that is very much the same case in the second half of the 20th century. And when state systems impose duties and economic policies that raise the price of imported consumer goods to extraordinary levels, they are going to have to accept some of the same realities as the English government did in the 18th century. Finally, some of the effects of smuggling as seen in these cases today. Again, smuggling for trading empires, it was true of England as it was true for Spain, Portugal, is a necessary evil. Economists would say that trading empires have built into them certain economic irrationalities. It's economically irrational to have a closed system which you cannot function effectively in. In other words, yes, it's fine that England may have a monopoly uh, on trade with the American colonies, but if it cannot supply goods uh, sufficient to meet those colonies' needs, if it cannot supply goods at prices that are reasonable, that are affordable, if it cannot create a system where producers have reasonable expectation of profit for their export goods, then you've got an irrational system. Smuggling helps counteract those irrationalities. It helps make up for them. Okay, yes, it's very high duty on goods uh, 
uh, like tea and coffee and uh, tea, hmm? uh, tea and tobacco, etc. But there's a solution. We'll smuggle most of it. <laughs> and therefore, we won't have to pay that. So the system can maintain that irrationality that's important for its overall existence, and that is claiming this monopoly control, but we can still survive within it. So smuggling is important to the survival of these systems. It is the necessary evil that makes these systems continue to function. At the same time, it's important to remember that the example that I gave you with the American Revolution and the Boston smugglers points to another reality. And that is that this is a single system to look at legitimate British trade and then say, well, over here we have this other thing that we call the smuggling community, the smuggling underground, whatever you want. Now, the two exist together. As we just saw and have seen in past cases, the system that creates these monopolies, these high duties, you know, these closed trading systems, it depends upon the smugglers to ease the irrationalities so the system doesn't collapse. By the same token, the smugglers depend on the fact that you have created monopolies, that you have created high duties and taxes in order to make a living. Their business depends upon that set of facts. If there are no monopolies, if there are no high duties, if there are no restrictions on trading certain goods, there's no reason to smuggle. Now, for most merchants who may smuggle on a part-time basis, that's welcome news that you're going to lower the duties, get rid of the monopolies. But for that group who are devoted primarily to smuggling, that's disastrous news. That's why the Boston smugglers wanted to go after the East India Company. They feared the lowering of duties would, in fact, destroy an important part of their smuggling business. The two sides are inextricably linked. They can't have one without the other. That's why the Boston smugglers are so upset, because the British Empire isn't playing its proper role. It's lowering duties. It's making things cheaper. You're not supposed to do that. We can't survive that way. We're looking at a single system. One part makes the other part possible. One part makes the other part viable. Ultimately, in this experience, England will begin to move towards free trade, as will other countries. They will discover that, indeed, the best way to stop smuggling is to lower the duties. And we will see that next week, particularly in the 19th and in the middle of the 20th century. And finally today, we've seen a somewhat distinctive case that smugglers aren't just smugglers. They aren't just responding to high duties and tariffs. They can actually have considerable impact upon the world in a very real and political way as in the American Revolution.